Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Egg Whisperer. I want to get started answering your questions right away tonight. We're going to start with Anna Lucia's question. She says this, thank you Dr. Amy for your show and for your answer to a previous question. I'm sad now, I just had a miscarriage. I'm 42 years old and my AMH is 1.43 and I had two normal embryos. I did PGS. My progesterone and estradiol levels are very low, 8.3 and 147. I've been taking estradiol 6 milligrams and crinone 100 milligrams daily. What are the reasons for these low levels and how can I improve them? Thank you very much for your guidance. So Anna, here is what I can reassure you about. When it comes to progesterone, the level expected in your blood is basically based on the mode of administration. When I have a patient on crinone and their progesterone level is 8, I say, well, that's because you're placing it vaginally. It then has to go through the walls of the vagina, get absorbed, and then go into your bloodstream, and then we can pick up the level in your blood. A level of 8 to me isn't bad at all. My goal for a vaginal administration of progesterone for patients who are undergoing a frozen embryo transfer is actually close to around 10. I'm just a little bit picky about it. So I would say what you could do is add some Prometrium or maybe an injection of progesterone every other day. But I certainly don't want you to worry that your progesterone level is too low for a healthy implantation to occur. As far as your estrogen level, a level of, uh, I think you said almost 150, is pretty similar to the level that you would see around ovulation time. So six milligrams of estrogen, it sounds like 150 is also pretty normal. I wouldn't worry about it. But talk to your doctor about your concerns. I would say if you're worried, there's an easy fix, and I know these numbers sometimes make us worry unnecessarily, especially when we go to Google and we start typing things in, we can see things that make us really upset, like progesterone should be over 20. And the thing is that that's if you're using an injectable form of progesterone. So with crinone, which is a vaginal form, you're just fine. This next question is from Nicole. Hi, Nicole. I recently had a fertility evaluation as diagnosed with DOR. I became freaked out and decided to go through the embryo freezing process. I just turned 38 and here are my stats, AMH of 0.34, FSH of 10, estradiol of 57. I was started on gonal F150 and 10 units of low dose HCG. On my first ultrasound, there was only one follicle, but on my second ultrasound three days later, there were four, but the lead follicle was already 19 millimeters. My team scheduled me for a trigger only after four days of stem and retrieved one egg from my lead follicle. Does this mean that I'm a high responder? Everyone keeps telling me it takes only one egg. But I'm disappointed and I don't understand how this all happened so quickly. Is it possible that a lower dose of meds would result in far more mature follicles and the possibility of more exit retrieval? So Nicole, what you're describing is not necessarily a high responder, but I would say a fast responder. And it's true. It does just take only one egg. But more is always more. Less is more when you have less. That's kind of what I tell people. So what you you know, basically learn from this experience is that maybe there's another way of do, doing things for you. You might be a good candidate for just a little whiff of estrogen priming that could possibly suppress your eggs just a little bit. Sometimes in cases like yours, I would have you take a Ganarelic shot. So that's the antagonist that you would do around cycle day one. That's another way of doing it. The other approach would be to just do a completely different type of stimulation. And what I mean by that is you can start stimulation after ovulation. I know that sounds very confusing. But what we've learned by going through IVF with thousands and thousands of people is that you don't necessarily have to start IVF meds at the start of your period. You can do a random start or a start in the luteal phase. So talk to your doctor about that and see if that's something that they would help you with. I would also repeat your FSH estradiol and don't start STEM on cycle day two if your estrogen is really high. Because basically that's just telling you that you're probably only gonna get one egg to grow if it's really high. I hope these tips help you. This next question is from Anna. Anna says this, first thing, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge. I'm in a shared risk program. The program is up to six IVF cycles with a live birth or money back. I'm 39, I've had two egg retrievals one month apart. Both egg retrievals resulted in two abnormal PGT tested embryos, one of which was mosaic. I'm gonna be starting my next cycle soon. Thanks to this suggestion that you made, I'm doing it without birth control. I'm increasing gonal from 225 to 300, Metapure 75, Cetratide, and HCG trigger. HGH is not an option at this clinic. For cycle one, I had 11 mature eggs. In the second cycle, I only had six. Due to this decline, my doctor said if the next cycle was unsuccessful, 
I would likely be removed from the program. Luckily, I would get my money back. My question for you is this, would it be worth trying another IVF cycle, which would be my fourth, or using that money toward donor egg cycles? I really would prefer to use my own eggs, but I'm starting to feel defeated. Thank you. So Anna, I would say that the experience you're having at your age is actually quite normal. It is part of the normal fertility experience for women over 39 to have to do several cycles to even get one embryo that has normal chromosomes. What tells me that you should keep going is the fact that you have a little mosaic, you're making mature eggs that are fertilizing, you even had double digit eggs not that long ago, and you're making blastocysts, but they're just not normal. If you have it in you to do a four cycle, I would persist and make sure you're taking all the egg quality supplements that I talked to you about. However, you know the three questions that I often ask people. What do I want? What is it going to take? And am I willing to do it? So it sounds like you are willing to consider other options. And that might be what it might take to have, let's say, more than one baby. And if you're just done with this whole fertility patient business and you're ready to be a parent, I can tell you that using a donated egg would give you, you know, if you think about it, 10% chance that your egg would be genetically viable when you're close to 40. So that's a 90% chance that it won't be versus if you use a donated egg, there's a 90% chance depending on the age of that egg donor that the egg will be viable. However, you have to be ready to move on. And so what I tell patients is this, talk to your three to five year self, say, hmm, Anna, who is 44 years old, would you ever look back after holding your baby, baby conceived with a donor egg and say, I wish I had tried one more time with my own eggs? If the answer is yes, I would say, do that four cycle. If the answer is no, I would say move on to donor eggs. That mosaic embryo of yours, I have to tell you, has still probably a 40% live birth rate. Talk to your doctor, talk to the genetic uh, counselor that's affiliated with the genetic testing company that you did the testing with, talk to an outside genetic counselor, talk to everybody. There's a Facebook group that um, only has people who have mosaic embryos in that group talk to them, you know, um, kind of join that group and learn about the experiences of other people out there who had mosaic embryo transfers and see what they have to say. And then you might want to then be open to transferring your mosaic embryo because mosaic embryos can turn into beautiful pregnancies. Just because a small percentage of the cells are abnormal doesn't mean that you will have an abnormal baby. But talk to all the professionals first before you make that decision. This next question is from Sally. Sally says, I'm 37 years old with unexplained infertility. Three months after my failed fresh transfer, I went back for my frozen embryo transfer. The doctor started by prescribing Climin, two milligrams and, uh, of estradiol and one milligram of cyproterone acetate. I took it for one and a half weeks, then bleeding started. The doctor said I experienced a hormonal withdrawal bleed because my body did not respond well to that medication. We had to stop everything at that point and attempt the procedure again next month. I did not get a chance to go back for the frozen embryo transfer yet, but I want to let you know that it took two months for my cycle to go back to normal. First, I had a full-blown period right after stopping the medication, then another full period two weeks after, then another period three weeks after that, then now finally my period is back to normal, just short of four weeks. What do you think of that medication? Do you recommend that I use it again for my next frozen embryo transfer? So my answer to you is no. I would take a look at your ovaries, see if there are any cysts on there that are secreting estrogen, because that's probably what's going on. It's probably that maybe your ovaries are, you know, maybe there's a residual cyst that's sitting there, the estrogen levels aren't completely going down, maybe you're ovulating, maybe you're not, and it seems like you need a little bit more control over your ovaries and taking higher dose estrogen only for a couple weeks might be everything you need to stabilize your lining so that this doesn't keep happening. So that's what I would recommend for you. The next question is, also from Sally, um, does chronic iron deficiency, hemoglobin of nine, have any effect on fertility? And I would say the answer is yes. We have seen in studies that being iron deficient and anemic can make it harder to get pregnant. And we also want to make sure that you're in the best shape ever, I mean, not just shape like physically, but also medically before starting a pregnancy journey. When you're pregnant, what can happen is, what, what, what happens more times than not, is we become anemic and that's a physiologic response of being pregnant. And so in a case like yours, if you're starting off already anemic, you can imagine it's gonna be something that your doctor's gonna worry about. You might need iron transfusions, you might need a blood transfusion depending on why you're anemic. But at the end of the day, you wanna figure out why is your hemoglobin so low? Is it genetic? Is it a form of thalassemia? Is it related to your diet? Is it because you're bleeding heavily when you're having periods? I would definitely get that investigated before a pregnancy. 
this next question is from Mary. And Mary says, hi, Dr. Amy, I thank you for all you do. I've been trying for one year and I'm 33 years old and now in the early fertility health stage. My AMH is 1.1 and I have a normal TSH. No male factor. I've been now trying monitor natural cycles plus endometrin two times a day and estrace once a day plus Ovidril. What do you suggest for the next steps? So Mary, you're 33 years old and you guys all know what my tushy method stands for. So I see that you've done some hormone testing, you've done sperm testing, but I wanna make sure that you've had your fallopian tubes checked. So fallopian tubes could be the reason why a young person with good levels and good sperm, things just aren't meeting and you're not getting pregnant naturally. So I'd strongly suggest if you haven't already, do a fallopian tube check, also known as the HSG. I have an article on my blog, dramy.org, go to it, and I think it's titled um, what to expect from the HSG. And it's a pretty good reminder of what might happen that day so that you're prepared for it. I can tell you that it's not an experience many people enjoy having, so it can be a little bit painful. If your fallopian tubes are open, awesome. Maybe consider a whiff of fertility pills. And when I say whiff, I mean a low dose, so you're ovulating no more than two eggs. And then you can combine that with insemination. Otherwise, you guys all know my egg whisper golden rules. If you're over the age of 32 and you don't already have a baby at home and you want at least two, strongly consider freezing eggs, freezing embryos, or both. And the reason is we know how precious our fertility is. We know that we don't grow eggs as we age. And we know that when you're older and you're ready to, let's say, start trying again for baby number two, I can tell you from my experience, my patients who have eggs frozen from when they were 33 are gonna feel a lot more comfortable waiting. And, um, and it's just, it's a different feeling when you know you have eggs frozen and you're over the age of 35 trying for your second baby. Then it's this next question comes from Stephanie. And Stephanie says, hi, Dr. Amy, I recently had a miscarriage at nine weeks after IVF with ICSI. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Shortly after the DNC, my breasts started making milk. If I press on them, white liquid comes out and leaks throughout the day. I also have a headache that started before the DNC and just hasn't stopped. What are my next steps in your opinion? Is this normal after only nine weeks of pregnancy? I read about pituitary tumors, but don't want to get myself worried over something that's common after pregnancy. Thank you so much for your help. So Stephanie, that's true. Pregnancy can cause an elevation of the hormone called prolactin. So what I would suggest is this. Don't touch your boobs. Don't squeeze your nipples. Don't try and see if something's going to come out for two weeks. Then go on fasting for a prolactin level and see where you're at. If the level is elevated, you definitely need a workup. If the level is low, then we know you're fine. However, I definitely want you to take your headaches very seriously. Be sure you're advocating for yourself, reporting your symptoms, and getting the help you need. Go to a specialist, see your primary care doctor first, and see what they say. Maybe you need a neurologist and um, other advice and guidance. For patients who have a high prolactin, we also refer them to medical endocrinologists as they can help advise patients as well. This next question comes from Kim. And Kim is asking about the COVID vaccine. Her question is, if you're eligible to get the COVID vaccine when you're on STEM, should you get it or wait? So Kim, I would say get it. It just really also depends on what you're doing as far as work and stuff like that. What I mean by that is this. Um, let me just kind of explain how I feel about it. Um, you can get COVID from anywhere. You can get COVID from the medical system that's in that clinic that you're going to. You just don't know. So my thought process is, as soon as you have the, the chance and the ability to get the vaccine, get it. However, there have been people that have bad reactions to it. What I mean by bad, I just mean feeling really crummy, feeling nauseous, having you know arm pain, having um, maybe a very, very low grade fever. So some people say, don't get the vaccine within seven days of an egg retrieval or a transfer. So you know maybe consider that in your situation. So it just kind of depends on where you are in your stem cycle and whether you can actually delay and have a choice as to when you can get the vaccine. But I don't think the vaccine is gonna hurt your golden eggs at all. This next question is from Phil. Phil said, um, let's see here. Um, I see what your question is. So it sounds like, um, I'm sorry that you had something so tragic happen to you. So what you're sharing is that um, at 16 weeks of pregnancy, your pregnancy stopped growing and you, you realize that through DNA testing, your DNA testing was negative. And so you're asking, how can you prevent this from happening again? And what you share with me in your question is that you actually started 
having basically labor pains and then basically um, the pregnancy miscarried. So that could be due to something called cervical incompetence. I hate the word incompetence. Like it just sounds so mean. Another word for it is cervical insufficiency. So some of the things doctors do in cases like this is refer you to a high risk OBGYN to talk to you about certain strategies that some people say is a good thing, some people say isn't, and that's adding progesterone supplementation, adding aspirin, perhaps doing something called a cerclage. So a cerclage is a stitch around the cervix. There are different ways of doing a cerclage. One way is from below, and that's called transcervical. The other way is from above, and that's called a transabdominal cerclage. So talk to your doctor about all these options and see what they think. But I think one of the most important things for you to do is make sure you get pregnant with one embryo at a time. So don't put two in and don't try to super ovulate and try and get pregnant with more than one because having a twin pregnancy, if you have a history of cervical insufficiency, can be dangerous. Okay, so this next question is from Celine and Celine asks, do you know which sites in the Bay Area do oil-based dye for the HSG? I prefer to avoid iodine and can't find anyone that will provide oil-based dye. And so the answer is no one really does oil-based dye anymore. I'm sorry. Everyone uses the iodine-based dye. And there is, an, uh, there is a form of iodine-based dye that doesn't have iodine in it that people who have an iodine allergy can use, but it's not oil-based. This next question is from Vina. Vina says, I had two early miscarriages last year. My AMH is 0.77. My recent blood work showed abnormal ANA, titer of 1 to 640, antiphospholipid, antibodies negative, CRP negative, thyroid panels within normal limits. What does it mean and how should I investigate this further? Do you think it could be the cause of my miscarriages? Does it have anything to do with a low AMH? So Vina, typically when someone has a low AMH, I never just say, you know, you have bad eggs. I also look at your age. Age is the most reliable predictor of egg quality. So if your AMH is 0.77, it could mean that maybe your egg quality or your egg age is older than your chronological age, but I'm just not sure what your age is. But if your age is, let's say 40 and your AMH is 0.77, well, we know that it's just harder to find a good egg at 40 regardless of your AMH. So my thought process in a case like this is to say you've had two early miscarriages and I'm sorry about that, but for you, go through my angel workup or angel method. You can find it in angelmethod.com, rule out a septum, look at genetic stuff. It sounds like you've already looked at a lot of things like autoimmune factors and you found that your ANA is positive, but I'll tell you this, 15% of people in the population are ANA positive and doesn't necessarily mean anything. However, the titers that you're at, it would be really important. I bet your doctor already did this, is do a workup, including lupus anticoagulant, antiphospholipid antibodies, and it sounds like you already did that. But if you were a patient of mine, I would refer you to a rheumatologist to look at everything and make sure we didn't miss anything. Having a positive ANA might not be the reason why you're having the miscarriages. It might be more related to egg quality than anything else. This next question is from Eliza. Eliza asks, what supplements do you have your patients continue to take during STEM? Obviously a prenatal, but what about NAC, NAD, CoQ10, vitamin E, low aspirin, low dose aspirin, and vitamin D? So I tell my patients to continue their supplements until I'm done making all the embryos that they'll need for their future family. What does that mean? Exactly what you just rattled off, except no aspirin. I don't use aspirin during STEM unless someone has a history of factor V positivity or prothrombin gene mutation, family history of a blood clot or a personal history of blood clot. Otherwise, I don't use aspirin during my STEM. But vitamin D, prenatal with fish oil, NAD, CoQ10, those are the kinds of things that I also talk to my patients about taking as well. This next question is from Sarah. Sarah, thank you for sending this in. And you share with us that you just completed your first egg retrieval last week. Your doctor diagnosed you with DOR, which stands for Diminished or Decreased Ovarian Reserve, for those of you who don't know what that acronym means. For reference, I'm 34 with an AFC of 11. AFC stands for antral follicle count. That's the number of eggs that you could potentially grow in a cycle, and we check that number typically at the beginning of an IVF cycle. AMH of 1.93 and FSH of 9.4. On my first retrieval, I had 15 eggs retrieved. More than expected, I had 13 follicles on ultrasound, 10 were mature, and 7 fertilized. Then on day six, I got the call that only two made it to blast and they were day six, three BBs. My PGTA test is pending. My questions are, do you think I have DOR based on these numbers? My doctor has never explained why I have it other than she said I should have at least a follicle count of 20 for my age. So my answer is, 
Let's wait until we see what your genetic testing results show. I don't like labeling people with stuff like that, but when your FSH is closer to 10 and your follicle count is around 11, even though you got more eggs, I would say, yeah, I mean, that's probably part of our story. This is probably an egg story as to why you're having to do IVF. And I, I applaud you. I'm glad you're doing IVF because obviously it's also going to preserve your fertility and secure more options in the future. But I do think that there's an aspect of DOR when you have, let's say, 15 eggs and you end up with, I think you said, two blastocysts. Two blastocysts is excellent, still at 34. So I'm hoping that you're going to find out soon that your blastocysts have normal chromosomes. And then talk to your doctor about embryodiamonds.com. You can go to that site and look at all those things with your doctor, including the implantation rate per embryo. And that's going to be based on the quality of the embryos that you have. So be sure to review all that stuff with them. Your second question, Sarah, is also great. Can my protocol impact the quality of my eggs? I was on 10 days of 150 menopure, 300 gonal, 100 clomid, and dexamethasone. Would you recommend a different protocol for my next retrieval? So based on the fact that you got so many mature eggs, you said 10 were mature. I mean, that's really good. And of the 10, seven fertilized. You got two day six blasts. So I'm not sure that changing the protocol is that important. However, if let's say you find out that the embryos didn't have normal chromosomes, maybe consider doing the following. Add HGH. I personally don't like Clomid. I don't use it in my IVF protocols. I'd rather use Femera instead. So perhaps do that switch. Use Femera. Dexamethasone can sometimes help some people make their ovaries more responsive. Maybe try that. And if you do all those things, switch out to Femera. Add HGH. Be sure to also add more egg quality supplements, the ones that I refer to, like the NAD. That's one that can help. Maybe higher dose CoQ10 next time. I don't know if you shared with me how you started your cycle, whether you use birth control pills or not, but if you use birth control pills, maybe take those out. I mean, I'm not sure that that's going to make the biggest difference. And then take a look at the sperm quality on the day of the egg retrieval and see what you can do to make the sperm extra sparkly. Maybe adding pixie or something like that could help when you're fertilizing the eggs. Okay, guys, this next question is from Mary. Hi, Mary. You said, I'm 33 and I've been trying for our first baby for the past two years. I had a miscarriage this past summer and I'm now seeing a fertility doc to see if IVF is the right choice, choice for me. My blood work came out pretty much fine day three of my menstrual cycle. My AMH is at 2.44, FSH is five, LH is seven. My left ovary showed seven to eight follicles, my right ovary five to six. My prolactin was high at 37.5 and the doctor prescribed me medicine to bring the level down. And I was also given birth control pills until my hysteroscopy, which was done this past week. Tubes are open, uterus looks good. So I'm not sure why we're not able to conceive naturally. Me and my husband have also gone through genetic testing. Mine showed that I carry a gene for thalassemia and PCOS. With the information provided, do you suggest I go for IVF or try other methods first like IUI? Any other tests you think I should undergo and what all questions should I be asking my RE before deciding on IVF? So Mary, one of the things that I would do is make sure that you've done enough genetic screening. It sounds like you did a carrier screen. I'm not sure if you did a chromosome analysis or not. Have you and your husband do that as well before you go through IVF? It sounds like you've had a thorough evaluation of your uterus and you've ruled out a uterine septum. So just use those words with your doctor and say, did you rule out a uterine septum during my hysteroscopy? Sounds like the answer is yes, but that's one box you can check if they say, yes, I did. The other reason why sometimes pregnancies can miscarry is if you have a condition called adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is something that drives me bonkers and something I deal with quite a bit in my practice. And I know fertility doctors everywhere deal with it too, but that's another question to ask your doctor. Have you ruled out adenomyosis in my case? That's something you might wanna know now because it might change the protocol that your doctor uses. And then the other thing is looking at sperm. I know. The sperm's swimming just fine, but I can tell you that some guys have beautiful swimmers. They look like they're superstars, and then you do a DNA test on the sperm, and you're like, holy smokes, you can't judge a book by its cover, and that applies to sperm too. So in a case when I have a patient who's had two miscarriages, even if the sperm looks extra sparkly on semen analysis, I still sometimes talk about doing a sperm DNA fragmentation test. So something for you guys to consider as well. Overall, I think that your chances of having a healthy pregnancy after IVF would be really high. 
Do you need to do IVF? No, but at the age of 33, knowing that you've been trying for two years, I think it would be a great way of being able to secure future options for yourself so you can have a second baby in the future without waiting another two years and dealing with more miscarriages. Obviously, IVF doesn't fix everything, but it can fix sometimes, in a lot of cases, um, things related to having recurrent miscarriages. If maybe one of the reasons you had the last two miscarriages was because the pregnancy didn't have normal chromosomes. So I would strongly suggest when you do IVF to consider PGTA in your situation and be sure to do a chromosome analysis if you haven't already. This next question is from Ashley. And Ashley says this, what are typical beta HCG levels, let's see here, of a healthy pregnancy at 14 days post ovulation in the first few weeks of pregnancy? I did a letrozole cycle IUI and got a positive pregnancy test. At 14 days post ovulation, I had a blood HCG of 46. At 16 days, it went to 116. Is this on track because it's doubling? And is it a problem that it's low at 14 days post ovulation? Ashley, anytime someone finds out they're pregnant and they get an HCG level, you go online and Google it and it makes you feel like your levels are low. I can tell you a level day 14 post ovulation of 46, it's still good. I'm not worried. However, we're made to put, we're almost put into this category called HCG hell, right? Where you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And you feel like there's no way it's going to be a healthy pregnancy, but I'm not worried. The fact that you're the rate of rise, you basically had an epic increase of your HCG hormone. I'm not worried about your pregnancy since it started off what you consider a little bit low. I have plenty of pregnancies that start off at 46, 14 days post ovulation that turn into perfectly healthy pregnancies. And I really hope that yours is going to do the same also. In a case like yours, to reassure you, I would repeat another level in a week. I'd bring you in maybe for an ultrasound two and a half weeks later so that you feel really good about everything that you're seeing. This next question is from Natasha. Natasha says, I'm 29 and I have an AMH of 28 and a follicle count of 20. I have no diagnosed fertility issues. My partner has lower sperm motility and morphology. We recently completed our first IVF cycle with ICSI and we're really disappointed in how it went. We did a short protocol, starting with the full on cycle day two, added cetratide on day seven and triggered on day 11 with Bucerolin. Switched from HCG due to high estrogen over 9,000. I had 16 good sized follicles going into egg collection, but I only got five eggs and all were almost empty, all my follicles. All five were mature, four fertilized, two made it to blast, graded 5BB hatching and 3CB. I had both transferred individually with frozen embryo transfers and neither implanted. Why do you think the majority of my eggs were empty at collection? What would you recommend we do in our next cycle to increase your chances of having a greater number of eggs collected? So Natasha, I have a feeling that your doctors were worried. They were worried that you could get really, really sick from your IVF cycle. So I imagine what they did is they probably chose to trigger you at a time when your follicle sizes weren't as big as they needed to be to get enough mature eggs. That can happen. Your safety was number one to them. And I totally get it because right now with COVID, no one wants anyone sick pre-COVID, but especially now, no one wants any patients going to the emergency room feeling really crummy after an egg retrieval. So one suggestion is to consider a hybrid cycle. So that's a combination of Femera and low-dose injections. Get watched super, super uh, frequently and closely so that you can get maybe like 10 follicles to grow to maybe about 20 millimeters and then do maybe a combined low dose HCG and Lupron trigger shot to get beautiful mature eggs. We know that even when you get five mature, you have blastocysts. And before you do another cycle, do more genetic screening. It sounds like you didn't genetically test your blast and that's okay. At your young age of 29, you would think you wouldn't need it. But consider a chromosome analysis first before another cycle. When I have a patient nowadays who chooses to do IVF without genetic testing, I think it's so important to check a chromosome analysis first because it's sometimes a huge, not sometimes, it's always a big bummer to find out much later, maybe even years later, that you should have done genetic testing when you find out that one of you might have had a translocation, for example. So that's one little tip for you. So, why, so that's the reason why I think the majority could have been empty at collection. The other thing is that um, it's possible, yeah, I think that's probably the main reason. And I shared with you my tips for another successful, uh, a more successful retrieval. This last retrieval sounds like it was a great, uh, I know, here I am, Pollyanna, glass always, I know, what is the word, half full, more full, always full. 
<laughs> you know what I mean. This next question is from Patricia. Patricia says, hi, Dr. Amy. I love your YouTube channel. I'm 36. I did IVF a year ago. No male factor. I have bilateral endometriomas, three small fibroids, HCG done, all clear, follicle count is three on each ovary. My AMH is 1.35, FSH is nine. Protocol was gona, I'll just say gonal F, 450 menopure with 13 days of it, 1,000, uh, 10,000 HCG trigger, and then I took progesterone twice a day. Let's see here. Um, seven eggs were retrieved, three follicles were missed, three eggs fertilized, and then I had three day three embryos with a fresh transfer. I had one eight cell embryo and two seven cell embryos. My next protocol in April is the same. My clinic doesn't test embryos and they only offer ERA before frozen cycles. What else can I do to improve my chances? I take CoQ10, acai berry, vitamin C and D, folate, pine bark, fish oil, and I added NAD, NAC, and I'm also taking DHEA and waiting for melatonin to arrive. HGH isn't available in my country. I only want one healthy baby. Much appreciated in advance. You do a brilliant job to help couples. Hmm. Thank you, Patricia. So one of the questions that I have is this. Are any of the fibroids getting in the way of a healthy implantation? Ask your doctor, do I have any fibroid that could be labeled as submucosal? While you had an HSG, sometimes when you have an HSG, they don't look at the cavity as closely. So ask your doctor during the HSG, were they able to see the cavity clearly? And if not, would it make sense for you to do a saline infusion sonogram and or a hysteroscopy? When I have a patient who has endometriosis, I always think that her egg age could be older than her chronological age. What that means is that endometriosis can affect egg quality. So in a case like yours, I would consider doing a frozen embryo transfer if you can. Bank embryos now while you're making them. Maybe consider another two cycles, not just one more in April. Freeze your embryos and then treat the endometriosis. Treat it based on your symptoms and the size of the endometriomas. If they're big and you're having pain, do a laparoscopy perhaps, or consider taking Depo-Lupron before you transfer. The other thing that I do for my patients who have obvious endometriosis during their stem cycles, I wanna prevent that rise of estrogen that can also continue to stimulate endometriosis. And I have my patients take Femera, also known as letrozole throughout the cycle. So sometimes I'll have them take two tablets a day, every single day, until their trigger shot day to make the endometriosis stay away. This next question is from Marissa. Marissa says, hi, Dr. Amy. Thank you so much for everything that you do. I'm 42 and I'll be 43 in April. I sadly lost my son at 40 due to preterm premature rupture of membrane, also known as P-PROM, at 19 weeks due to incompetent cervix. My son was conceived via IUI using clomid 100 milligrams and 150 IUs of gonal F. I have a blocked right fallopian tube. He was genetically normal. Since that time, we attempted three more IUIs and did four embryo transfers. In each protocol, I was on clomid 100 milligrams with 150 of menopure and 150 of gonal. During IVF, I produced on average four to seven mature eggs and one to two five-day blasts. No PGS testing was done. Sadly, no transfer worked. Three were fresh and one was a natural FET last month. We did the tushy and balls check. Everything was okay. In August, my hysteroscopy showed a small polyp and that was removed. I did an ERA and needed an extra day of progesterone, which we did before this last transfer. Unsure what to do next. At this point, should I continue IVF or go back to IUI? Marissa, it's so hard to, to hear the story that you're sharing with me. And I think it's so important for everyone to hear your story because so many people have gone through similar things and you're so brave to just message me so that I can share this with everyone. So other people have gone through the simi a similar thing know that they're not alone and there is hope. So here are my thoughts. When you're 42 going on 43, it's really hard to find a good egg. So what I mean by that is the most likely scenario as to why these transfer didn't work is probably because the embryos didn't have normal chromosomes. My thought is this. We also know that at 19 weeks, you had P-PROM. We also know that one fallopian tube is blocked. So for me, I like to connect those things and ask myself, is the fallopian tube potentially blocked because of endometriosis or adenomyosis? Did the P-PROM occur because of adenomyosis? So adenomyosis increases our risk of having P-PROM. Endometriosis can also get in the fallopian tubes and cause tubal blockage. So we're dealing with 
several factors that could be playing a role in your fertility issues. So at some point you have to say, it might make sense for me to stop moving forward with my own eggs and consider donor eggs. However, that's a personal decision for you to make and not for anyone else to tell you. As long as you're having mature eggs, which it sounds like you are on average four to seven, and it sounds like you're making blasts. Most recently you said you made one to two day five blasts. So if you have it in your heart and emotionally and physically, you can go through more cycles. I would say do that, freeze the embryos and do some extra testing. You've done the ERA test. You've done the hysteroscopy to remove a polyp maybe consider testing for endometriosis and or adenomyosis. Ask your doctor about repeating the HSG to make sure there isn't a hydrosalpinx and consider doing the receptiva DX test to see if there's any silent endometriosis. And then ask your doctor those questions. Do you think I might have adenomyosis? Could that be the reason why I had the PPROM? And see what your doctor says. This next question is from Ella. Ella says, I am 35 and a half. My AMH is between 0.27 and 0.4. All my other labs are within normal limits and my husband has low motility. We have our fourth retrieval scheduled in March. My first cycle in 2017, I primed with birth control pills and was on an antagonist protocol and my second FET was successful. Yay. My second retrieval in July 2020 using the same protocol but primed with progesterone that was canceled due to poor response. The third retrieval this past no November was a natural cycle letrozole follistin men and pure cycle with Omnitrope. My follicles responded but I ovulated when I went in for retrieval. My doctor is encouraging estrogen priming. What are your thoughts about it with DOR? Can it suppress like birth control pills? I also suffer from migraine, so I'm a bit hesitant about it. What would be your recommended protocol for me considering all of my history? This may be my last shot. So Ella at 35 and a half with an AMH of 0.27 to 0.4, I think you have still a good chance of having a healthy embryo. I'm very happy that you were successful with your cycle back in 2017. That is awesome. My thoughts on estrogen priming are this. I think that it can be really helpful, but not too much estrogen. You can be over suppressed with estrogen, just depends on the dose. So typically in a case like yours, I actually wouldn't, you know, go to estrogen priming. However, I would consider increasing the amount of Janarelic, starting it earlier and maybe doubling up on it but I also have used estrogen priming maybe three days before your anticipated period start, sometimes even a week before, if I'm worried about what your doctor is worried about, which is an earlier ovulation. The other thing that can sometimes be helpful is consider triggering, not just at 36 hours, but maybe at 34 hours, and then also doing a mid-luteal phase start. So mid-luteal phase starts is another fancy way of doing IVF. I don't know why I use that word fancy. It just seemed like a good word to use. It's not that fancy. It's basically the same way of starting IVF. You just start medications on a day and then you still move forward with all the, the medications from there. But rather than starting at the beginning of your cycle, you start after ovulation. So see if your doctor has experience with that and it might be a good thing for you. This next question is from Stephanie and Stephanie says, hi, Dr. Amy, I just needed some advice or tips for my situation. My husband is 42, no fertility issues. I'm 37 with unexplained fertility issues. We've done two IVF cycles at two different clinics. In my first cycle, I was 34 years old in 2017. I had 14 eggs retrieved, five made it to day five. As frozen embryos, I had two biochemicals, two miscarriages. The last one didn't implant at all. Our second IVF cycle in December of 2020 was also a fail. We had four eggs retrieved and none made it to day two. And it was heartbreaking as we thought this clinic was gonna be the one. And I heard lots of success stories from that clinic. Now we're on to a third clinic, going to go through our third round of IVF and haven't started anything just yet. And I want to take a break for a month or two. Any advice on our situation? I do have hypothyroidism. I have a fibroid, but on the outside of my uterus. I'm really sorry, Stephanie. You've gone through so, so much and you're still persisting. You're the definition of someone who's pretty darn resilient and pretty darn strong. And I just get so inspired by all the stories that people share with me on this show. Stephanie's especially, every single one so far tonight is inspiring because you guys are just doing the work and you're not letting anything get you down. One cycle, two cycle, three cycles, you're still picking yourself up. You have hope in your heart and you're walking into another clinic and you're saying, help me be a mother. And I really, really hope this next cycle is going to be it. So in a case like yours, I would say this. I think it's really important to reassess your AMH level, get a new baseline set of labs, 
What's your day three FSH? What is your estradiol level? Redo a semen analysis. Check sperm DNA fragmentation. Make sure you've done enough genetic screening. Look at a chromosome analysis for both you and your husband. Go through my angel workup, angelmethod.com. Look at all that stuff and make sure you've ruled all that out. There's a reason why you had those miscarriages back in 2017. It's to teach us what we need to know so that whatever we do next, hopefully we'll learn those lessons so you don't have another miscarriage. I wish it was as easy as that. I know it isn't, but I'm hoping that maybe through a workup, you might find out something that you didn't already know and whatever that is can help you with your next IVF cycle. There might be something genetic that's causing what you've gone through and I think it would be pretty helpful to find out now. My thought process in a case like yours without knowing all your you know, fertility hormone levels would be to talk to your doctor about doing HGH priming. Obviously there's some sort of embryo issue where they're just not implanting and that could be due to the egg quality, sperm quality or both. Take all the egg quality supplements, talk to your doctor about different protocols and it sounds like they're doing it and maybe consider doing a mid luteal phase start, especially if you have a lower uh, number of eggs. You shared in your second IVF cycle that you had four eggs retrieved and none made it to day two. So perhaps starting STEM a different way and considering a mini IVF cycle with no birth control pill start or estrogen priming, see if that's something that your doctor has considered or would consider for you. The other thing that sometimes can help is perhaps using a dual Lupron trigger. Sometimes I also add FSH hormone in with my trigger as well, and that might be a helpful strategy. Someone saying, Dr. Amy, is your mom still upset with you? Um, she is. She says I don't smile enough. She doesn't hear anything that I say when I'm on. I was on Good Morning America yesterday, and my mother literally said, um, you didn't smile. And I was like, love you. Okay, it's cute. This next question is from Jumana. Jumana says, hi, Dr. Amy, love watching your videos. My husband and I have been married for one and a half years and we've been diagnosed with unexplained infertility. I tried Clomid and it delayed my cycle, so I switched to Femera. I tried one IUI and one IVF and both didn't work. While, my IVF, while in my IVF cycle, I took Femera on day two and Menopure 75, six injections total per day. I ended up having six follicles, four abnormal and two fertilized on day three and two embryos were transferred. The doctor told me to start DHEA and wait for three months. I went to another doctor who told me to take ProMax supplements and monitor my ovulation. After monitoring, I had two follicles without medication, one 16 millimeter and the other is nine. I was given an HCG trigger and told to have intercourse on specific days. Does this show that my egg reserve isn't good? What options do I have? Should I take DHEA? What dosage? I'm 31 years old and I have limited medical intervention here in Jordan. So Jumana, yes, at 31 years old, if you have two follicles, time is of the essence. You're doing everything right. It sounds like you're being as aggressive as you feel comfortable being and you've already done IUI and IVF, but I would see if you can do more IVF cycles. You just never know when you're going to have the right egg sperm combo in a cycle and perhaps don't transfer this time. Perhaps start banking embryos because of your young age. It might be more helpful to maybe do two or three IVF cycles first before you start transferring. I'm not sure if genetic testing of embryos is available to you. If it is, perhaps consider doing that. And I think you're on the right supplements and also consider high dose CoQ10 if you can take that too. This next question comes from Melissa, and Melissa says, is it possible to ovulate late after an HCG trigger shot and IUI? For example, I took Femera 7.5 milligrams for five days. I triggered on cycle day 12 and did the IUI on day 14. I had a negative home pregnancy test days 29 to 31. I thought the IUI didn't work. No period for another nine days, tested on cycle day 39, got a positive. HCG on cycle day 41, 1636, three days later, 3750. I went in for an early ultrasound on, uh, on at seven weeks in one day and there was no fetal pull. The sac was there, the yolk sac was there and it was measuring five weeks, six days. Hmm. So Melissa is asking, is it possible I conceived after IVF on our own? And the answer is, it's possible that your urine pregnancy test just wasn't sensitive enough and the levels were really low and they started to go up. Of course, it's possible that you might have had an ovulation in between and got pregnant naturally. However, if you didn't have a period, it's more likely than not that this was actually an IUI pregnancy. 
and I'm sorry that you had to learn that it was not a healthy pregnancy. If you were a patient of mine, I would say, let's let this pregnancy teach us the lessons that we're meant to learn, and we would test it and look at the chromosomes. I can tell you, having a piece of paper to give a patient and say, this is why the pregnancy stopped growing, is, is, it doesn't change what happened, but no matter how smart you are, no matter how much science you know, we still will say things like, Amy, I think that happened because I walked up the stairs when I shouldn't have. Or I think I was standing on my bed and I was trying to hang something and I, I fell down and I bumped my butt. So there are lots of things that people think that, that, that they could have possibly done to have hurt their pregnancies that just isn't a thing. So I think it's something that's important for people to know out there. If you've had a miscarriage, if you're currently pregnant and you've just found out that your pregnancy is abnormal, see if you can get that pregnancy tested. The pregnancy testing that I'm talking about costs around $200 or so out of pocket if your insurance doesn't cover it. I've heard patients tell me, well, my doctor told me it'd be thousands of dollars and I couldn't afford it. And I'm like, no, that's not the case. So talk to your doctor more, call the company that they use and talk to them about the cost because sometimes that can really help. Sometimes what your doctor is telling you is the cost that your or the bill that your insurance is going to be sent from that company, not necessarily the actual bill that you're going to be getting to pay. So guys, thank you for joining me on Ask the Egg Whisperer tonight. It's always a pleasure being here to answer your questions. I'm going to go to your live chatted questions because I have time tonight. I'm going to start at the top and here we go. So just give me a second to get to the top here. And it is so fun to be able to talk to you guys. Um, here we go. Is it normal to have spotting or bleeding after an embryo transfer? And the answer is yes. Sometimes when you place the catheter and you go through the cervix, you can get spotting. Sometimes even just touching the cervix with a speculum can cause spotting too. So it is something that's normal and commonly seen. However, if it's been several days after your transfer, it could be due to ovulation, not ovulation, implantation. And then the other thing I do for patients who have spotting after transfer especially if they're extra worries, I like to check hormone levels. I like to check estrogen and progesterone, just reassure us that the levels are good because I feel like if there's something that I could do to make a patient feel better, I can tell you it makes me feel better too. Next question is from Natural Mystic. What do you think is the best way to add progesterone in the luteal phase for timed intercourse, vaginal, oral, or progesterone and oil? So what I would say to you is this, they're all the same. Outcomes are the same. However, the side effect profiles are different. If you inject a shot in your butt, it hurts like heck. If you place a suppository in your vagina, you get a vaginal slime. If you swallow a pill, you're going to feel kind of drowsy and a little bit woozy. So see what works best for you. Some patients like placing in their vagina. They don't mind the discharge. Other patients like taking the pill orally right before they go to sleep at night, and they feel fine the next day. And you can always alternate between them. And I've also had patients that's like, Amy, why would I do any of that? I'm just going to do a shot. It's easy. Next question is, here, Dr. Amy, I just had an ovarian wedge resection due to an ectopic pregnancy on my left ovary. How long should I wait until I can start IVF treatment? So my recommendation to you is, let's see here, um, can you walk? I'm just kidding. I'm such a smart aleg right now. Um, once you have something like that happen, everyone wants a plan. You're like, when can I get pregnant? And I totally get it. And that's literally like when I asked you, can you walk? That's what I do with my patients. You have surgery. I do a post surgery consult with you the next day if you feel like talking to me and then we'll see how you're feeling when your pain goes away and then we can move forward ASAP. So in someone who's had an ectopic pregnancy that can be a pretty traumatic situation for most people and so what you can do is let's say track your HCG levels once they're negative start birth control pills induce a period and start IVF right away. Alternatively, you can just go with the flow. And what I mean by flow, I mean the menstrual flow. You just wait until your period starts and then you can start your medications from there. Usually your period will start about six to eight weeks after even an ectopic pregnancy surgery. So talk to your doctor and see what they recommend for you. Next question, let's go to it right here. Um, hi, doctor. Uh, no, I think I just answered that one. Here's the next question. I'm 34. I was diagnosed with DOR, AMH 1.93, FSH 9, AFC 11. I got two genetically um, normal embryos out of 15 eggs. They were three BBs. For my next retrieval, my doctor is recommending microdose flare, and I got a second minute opinion, and she said this is a bad idea, and I should do 300 menopure with 300 gonal. Which protocol would you recommend? So my thought process is, why are we even changing the protocol? You got two blastocysts that had normal chromosomes. Why do we even think something is wrong and you need to change it? So my advice is to say, why are you changing it? I don't, if I have, you know, two gorgeous blastocysts that have normal chromosomes, 
believe me, I'm going to be too worried that changing it might not give me that. Um, next question is, how would you compare taking NAD and bean versus NMN and resveratrol for egg quality in women over 40? You know, I just pick things that are easy to take, and I don't want patients to be on a ton of things. And I don't necessarily know that anyone knows if one is better than the other. I just know that in my experience, anecdotally, I've seen some amazing things happen when patients take NAD and terostilbene, and I've also had patients taking NMN and resveratrol, and they have good results too. So maybe they're about the same. Next question is, should men take NAD and terostilbene also, or do they not improve sperm quality? And the answer is, they do. There is some evidence to suggest that they help with sperm quality too. This next question is, what would you recommend for someone with really low testosterone but high DHEA? Would you think that this would impact IVF outcomes? And the answer is possibly. I would want to know, however, what was your testosterone? Because sometimes it actually might be in the high end of normal and you think that it's actually normal, but it's actually trending high, higher than what would be considered normal for someone of your age and body size. So I don't just look at the ranges. I also look at the whole picture before I decide if someone really has a normal testosterone or not. Next question is, how bad is an AMH of 0.7 in a 36 year old? It isn't bad. I mean, you have eggs, that's awesome. And you might still have at least one to two good eggs per batch of seven. You just really wouldn't know until you made embryos or tried to conceive. And my suggestion to you, if you don't already have two kids, consider freezing eggs or embryos if you can. Next question is single to mommy. I'm 36 DOR, first IVF cycle resulted in three day five embryos, fresh transfers ending in a chemical pregnancy. Would you recommend transferring both remaining together? chances of one being normal and sticking. So the answer is that is a strategy that I've used before. I wouldn't be afraid of transferring two together, but I would also remember my three questions. Ask, would this transfer help me you know, achieve my goals? Because we know that in two years or so, if you're ready to have a baby at that point, the egg count will just be lower. So you might wanna consider doing another cycle first before you transfer these embryos. Next question is, hi, would you recommend Duostem? I just had my egg retrieval yesterday. My doctor is considering starting stem again on Monday due to only four eggs retrieved. My AMH is 0.69 and age is 32. And the answer is, I do Duostem as well. I'll give you a scenario. I had a patient, I did her retrieval this last weekend. Um, she had two follicles on her left ovary and I saw three super tiny ones on her right. And I've never seen follicles on her right ovary. And I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting. So we got an embryo cooking right now. And then she just started stem again. Um, three days after her retrieval, and we're going to see what happens. So the answer is yes. If your doctor thinks that duo stem could help you, that means your doctor is really comfortable with the duo stem approach, and that it, in their hands it works. So if your doctor feels like that's right, I totally would just go with the flow and see what happens. But there are some downsides to duo stem. One of them is if you start the stem and it doesn't seem like a good idea, and you stop the stem, then it can result in more cysts that can potentially form and it might take longer to start another cycle. Just something to think about. Next question is, should I know my progesterone level prior to a frozen embryo transfer? And the answer is you don't necessarily need to. I mean, when we do ultrasound at the lining check, we can see that the lining is nice and crisp and the, you know, the ovaries have no cysts. So then you don't really need a progesterone, but most clinics do it just to be a thousand percent sure that they're not being tricked that you might have ovulated them on them already, but it isn't necessary or required. Next question is, I miscarried 11 weeks on Tuesday. How soon can I take Letrozole again? I'll be 41 this year, so I don't have time to waste. Okay, so here's what I would do. This is what I would do in a case like yours. I would follow your HCG levels very, very closely and see what's going on. Take a look at your uterus, see what's going on with your lining, see when you're ovulating so that we can predict exactly when we can try again. If it looks like it's taking longer, if there's any retained tissue, we wanna know about that sooner than later. And I've even gone so far as even inducing a period without waiting for that ovulation so that we can get started ASAP on another treatment so that you can get pregnant again. I know how, I, I know that my patients feel better. I know well-intentioned, really nice OBGYN say things like, oh, just wait three months and come back and you can just take a break. But honestly, what helps so many of my patients is having a plan and knowing when they can start trying again immediately so they can get pregnant, hopefully with their next pregnancy that will be successful. This question is from Danae. I'm 36, 34 BMI. Cycle day four showed follicle count of six. Labs, FSH of eight, estrogen of 77. My AMH was 1.09 in May. Previous IUIs had a follicle count of 10 to 14 on day 11. Doctor says I have a 30% chance of IVF based on day four labs and follicle count, do you agree? And I would say, um, at 36 years old with an AMH of one, 
I, I would say that's a pretty conservative. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's just not over promising success. And I feel like 30% is pretty conservative and a, and a good number. Um, if you look at um, all comers in the United States and live birth rate for IVF cycles, no matter how old you are, it's about 30 to 35%. So 30% is actually, you know, a very good number to have in your mind. However, once you have a really strong blastocyst and that blastocyst also has normal chromosomes, then the likelihood of implanting is probably over 50%. Okay, let's see here. Next question is, my lining is 9.7, my estrogen is 780, I have one normal embryo to transfer next week. Advice on successful steps. So my best advice is to make sure that you've taken care of everything in your house. Not your literal house, I'm just talking about the house of your uterus. Since you have one embryo, have you done all the testing that you would want to do, like the ERA test and receptiva DX test? Have you done a saline sonogram in the last six months? Have you looked at your TSH level, for example, as well in the last six months? So those are the kinds of things that I think about. And if you're like, oh my God, Amy's just saying all these things and, and I really don't wanna do them, that's okay too. At least you had an opportunity to think about them. But if you wanna do them, guess what? You can change your transfer date to a biopsy date and you can do those extra tests if your doctor feels like they're appropriate for you. Everyone, sending everyone love. Okay, next question is, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm nine weeks pregnant with triplets via IVF and I've lost weight, very obviously due to food aversion. Is it dangerous to my babies and how long does it last? So Sammy, I think the most important thing is for you to hydrate. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. There are th powder packs like liquid IV, there's protein powders, there's IVs. So you can get nutrition through an IV, it's called parental nutrition. So talk to your doctor about getting you hooked up and nourished. Um, there's no reason to suffer, so um, we have infusion centers. I'm going like this because my infusion center is like right there. I can see it. So when I have a patient like you who's not able to has severe food aversion, I'm going to get you hooked up to an IV. Sometimes we even have patients stay overnight so they can get nourished even more, talk to a nutritionist, and get the help you need now. We want juicy babies. We want you to be super juicy. So we know that when you have triplets, those babies come early. So we don't want you to be losing weight right now as much as possible, but I don't want you to worry. Weight loss is very normal and a lot of pregnancies and everything is fine with the babies, but you don't want to be playing catch up too much later. Let's see here. Next question is, my RE started offering IV infusions at her office. Is there any validity in these? Are they rather ineffective? It just kind of depends on what kind of infusion they're talking about. Let's see here. My husband has a sperm fragmentation of 25. Could this be why I've had a chemical and a miscarriage with PGTA normals? The answer is yes, there is a possibility at 25 even. However, in my experience, I see it more so with the DNA fragmentation over 32. And that's where you start seeing more issues related to the DNA fragmentation. So in a case like yours, if you feel like it's time to get more embryos, do so. Repeat the sperm DNA fragmentation, have him see a urologist and rule out everything that's in the balls method, and also consider using Pixie as a technology that might help. Let's see here, quick question, can sex interfere with implantation? See, I usually tell patients don't have sex around implantation time because if you don't have implantation, guess what? You're gonna be asking, did the sex cause an implantation issue? So I typically tell people, you know, just wait until you have a positive pregnancy test and then sex is safe because that embryo is well implanted. Someone is asking, is my AMH 0.9 concerning? And I would say it isn't. However, you have to look at your age and look at how many kids you want and your goals, and then you can decide whether you want to freeze eggs or freeze embryos. Is adding progesterone cream while prepping for an F ET an issue? And the answer is yes. So you don't want to do creams before you start progesterone because that can interfere with the receptivity of your lining. So if you're doing that, start over. Next question is, I'm supposed to take progesterone 200 milligrams twice a day, one by mouth, one by vagina. Last night, I had both by mouth by mistake. Will it mess my IUI treatment up? And the answer is no. The reason why we don't tell patients to take two by mouth is guess what? You're going to feel super dizzy. That's a lot of progesterone orally. Just makes you feel a little woo. So if that's how you're feeling, that's the worst thing that can happen. I have had a patient who, she told me a story, it wasn't me because I don't prescribe medication like that, that she actually like almost passed out because she took two orally. So just be careful. Um, next question, what are your thoughts on adding Adderall to help with implantation? My thoughts are, that's novel. I have not heard of anyone adding Adderall to their protocol to um, improve implantation. Next question. I'm at the beginning of my journey. I'm 36 with an AMH of 0.7, FSH of 11.6. Oh, 
All other tests, including HSG and saline sauna, are normal. Do I have a chance of a successful pregnancy? The answer is yes, you do. Just takes one egg. And an AMH of 0.7 tells me you have several eggs to work with in each cycle. Take your CoQ10. Someone's asking, is there a way to boost progesterone naturally? Um, there, so um, if you go to the Prove, P-R-O-O-V website, there's a blog on seed cycling, S-E-E-D. Look that up because there are some foods that could potentially boost your progesterone naturally. So be sure to check that out. Next question is, hi, Dr. Amy. I started initial testing for IVF on Friday. I'm waiting for my period to start so I can get my day three testing and my follicle count checked. What can I expect after that? I'm 37 and my AMH is 37. Thank you. Um, so what I would say is what you want to do, it's hard to know what to expect, is ask them what to expect. Most clinics have this sort of checklist. Ask your doctor, what does my IVF pyramid look like? And what that means is how many eggs do they expect to get from you? How many embryos? And how many cycles will you need to do to get the number of embryos you need for the family size that you want? Make sure you've looked at the sperm, that it's sparkling. Ask them what they think you should do to prepare for your IVF cycle. Ask them what protocol are they using for you and why? And then ask them the side effects that you should be expecting along the way. The last thing you wanna be doing is freaking out over something that's totally normal. And I'll tell you what I mean egg white cervical mucus, my patients don't freak out because I always tell them, this is around the time that your estrogen is going to go up. This is how you're going to feel. It doesn't mean you're ovulating. This is how your body adjusts to that. Next question is, my doctor says no supplements like CoQ10 and Psy. None of them have any science behind them. So she should just not doing them. But I see a lot of doctors like you suggest them. What's the deal? So the deal is, she doesn't have experience with patients who haven't taken them, that have taken them and had a much better cycle. I have. And I can tell you, there's no acai berry company that's going to put millions of dollars into a study and randomize two groups of people to see what happens. And guess what? Acai berry never hurt anybody. CoQ10 never hurt anybody. We have really great data. And guess what? Animal studies. Animal studies have shown that if you give a little mouse CoQ10, they actually can retain their fertility a lot longer and have better quality eggs. True story. Are we mice? No. Does taking CoQ10 hurt you? No. So if you want to take it, even though your doctor says don't do it, um, I don't want you to feel like you're doing something your doctor is telling you not to do, but maybe have a healthy discussion with your doctor and maybe look up some of those studies that I'm referring to and maybe we can change their hearts and minds around this stuff. Next question is, hi doctor, my AMH is 0 0.04, LH44, estradiol 177, and my FSH is 55. I'm 34 years old. Do I still have a chance? So what your levels tell me is you have something called primary ovarian insufficiency. You want to meet with the doctor to find out why. Why at your young age are you going through basically premature menopause? Is this going to last forever? Is it just your ovaries taking a break? It's possible that this just might be a small break and then your ovaries are going to you know, start ovulating again soon, but you want to learn more. See if you have the option to retrieve eggs, make embryos, do an autoimmune workup, a genetic workup, take CoQ10, and I would say try to get pregnant you don't know when you're going to ovulate again next. You may not, but I would imagine in the next six months, you might have one ovulation and you want to see if you can capture that egg. I wish we had more technology to help people who are in the situation as you to do something to grow more eggs. And right now we just don't have that many options. Next question is, can I start working with a trainer prior to starting IVF in about two months? And my answer is yes, you definitely can. There's no reason why you shouldn't. Is it okay for those without DOR to take DHEA before retrieval or that hurt egg quality? My answer is, I don't like DHEA. I just don't. I think it makes people skin oily. It gives them acne. It affects their mood. Sometimes it causes cysts. I don't think it's that magic pill that other people think that it is. That's just me. Next question. I had an IUI done in January. Did tamoxifen, estradiol, trigger shot with cycle day 13. IUI was day 14. I'm on cycle day 39, no period, and negative HCG. Thoughts? Did the tamoxifen mess me up? I have low AMH. So it could be that you actually never ovulated, that you were just growing a cyst, and then you still have that cyst. So if you were my patient, I would say, come on in. What are you doing tomorrow? We'll take a look. We'll do a cyst check. We'll check your hormones because if you still have a cyst from your last ovulation, even though you ovulated, your hormone levels can be high. They can prevent your withdrawal bleed. So then all I would do is see where your levels were at, and then we can see, should I give you a trigger shot? Should I induce a period with progesterone again? There are a lot of different options as far as what you should be doing. So see your doctor and see what they say. Next question is, let's see here. How long should I wait for IVF after laparoscopy? I have not retrieved my eggs yet. So someone 
emailed that question earlier tonight, and I basically said, talk to your doctor, do a post-surgical consult. If you're feeling good, plan for IVF right away. Hi, doctor. I was curious if more severe middle shirts pain was a good sign of ovulation or something to be concerned about. Mm -mm, no. Good, strong middle shirts pain? Middle shirts. <laughs> Say that 10 times at 6.30 on a Wednesday night um, after you've been up since 6 in the morning um, with joy, of course, you guys. Um, so I would say, yeah, I don't see that as something that would be bad or concerning. I would say if you had pain at period time, pain with intercourse, pain with bowel movements, bleeding with bowel movements, like all that kind of stuff that can be signs of endometriosis, then I would worry. Next question. What are your thoughts on DHEA improving egg quality? And I would say I do give it for patients in the micronized version who have a very small number of eggs, but I check testosterone levels if indicated first. Next question is, I'm 36, my AMH is 0.7, FSH is 11.6, all other labs are normal, HSG normal, saline sauna normal, do I have a chance? The answer is yes. Should I skip IUI or go to IVF? I would say I would go to IVF as soon as you feel comfortable doing that. Next question, because IUI chances, like your, 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 your option to do IUI is just not going to go away. However, with IVF, your chances are going to be better now than they are going to be in a year from now. So I would do that now. Let's see here. I just turned 39. My AMH is 2.9. All labs are normal. My hysteroscopy three months ago was good, but I miscarried in December at 10 weeks. I'm starting IVF in two weeks. Is there any prep other than supplements before starting? And the answer is yes. Look at the sperm. Make sure that the sperm source is on supplements as well. Um, make sure you're healthy. Go through my fertility team. I think I have the website fertilityteam.com. Find group therapy, one-on-one -on -one therapist, um, talk to someone about your activity levels and exercise routine. Are you eating as healthy as you can possibly eat right now? Think about finding a good meditation practice that works well for you and a good mantra as you're going through fertility treatment. I'm always here with my patients saying, go to your happy place and find it. So that's a great way of preparing for your IVF cycle. And also take one of my IVF classes. Go to eggwhisperschool.com, join me. I think I do them maybe twice a month now. They're super fun. So I would say join me on my next Egg Whisper or IVF class to learn more. Next question, is it possible to have a healthy pregnancy after a uterine adhesion removal? And the answer is yes. Next question, 40 years old on my fourth IVF cycle, three-day blastocyst, six cells, untested embryo to be transferred in March. What are the chances that it will be a successful transfer? So a day three I think it's not a day three blastocyst, it's a day three cleavage cell embryo that has six cells. The likelihood of it being genetically normal at the age of 40 is probably, I hate to say it, around 5%, but it's still a chance and it's not zero. Hi, I'm taking Ovavite. Should I be taking additional CoQ10? I'm 39. I would say I don't think so. And hi. Next question. Hello. I had two frozen day three embryos transferred on January 21st. Today's ultrasound. My doctor confirmed one sac. She also saw a subchorionic hematoma. Hematomas are really common. If it's big, if you're having spotting, stop your aspirin. If you're on any blood thinners, stop that. Avoid heavy lifting, avoid sex, and go back in a week. I just think it's really reassuring when someone tells you you have a hematomato, that that tomato is going away, and you know it's not called a tomato. Next question is, and I understand, being it's normal to be afraid for a, hema, a hematoma. It's scary. I mean, like you go online, you Google it, and it's just like the worst. But I can reassure you that they're super common, even in healthy pregnancies, and it doesn't mean your pregnancy is going to go away. You didn't cause it. It wasn't because you did your laundry. It wasn't because you picked up a pan or did something else. It's just because that pregnancy is implanting and growing. Next question, I'm 35, FSH is 15. My doctor recommended FSH injections for one week, then IVF with a possible success rate of 40 to 60%. Do I have a chance of being successful with IVF? And the answer is yes, you do. I bet you have a really high egg count, and that's why your doctor is so reassuring about what your chances are. Um, next question is, what tests are needed if my period hasn't started and it's been 40 days? So I would ask, do you have PCOS? Do you have decreased ovarian reserve? Do you have HA, which is hypoglamic amenorrhea? Simple test to do, a random FSH, LH, estradiol. You can also do an AMH level, look at your thyroid levels, and prolactin. Let's see here. Um, I've had three IUIs and I'm about to start my fourth. Any advice? So ask your doctor if the sperm is sparkling. Literally say that. And they'll look at you and like say, huh? <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun if there's like this sparkle certificate that you could get? There isn't. So other things that you can do, increase the amount of medications that you're taking to maybe ovulate one more egg if your doctor thinks that's safe for you. 
consider a double IUI depending on your situation, and consider adding a technology. I use a little chip for my IUI called Zymot, Z-Y-M-O-T, and see if your doctor thinks that that's something applicable for your case and something that they do as well. Next question is, how important is it to have a low uh, FSH under 10 prior to treatment? I know my AMH is low at 0.2, and I have three follicles per month. I'm 35. I'm wondering if egg quality can affect it, be affected by my high AMH. So this is the deal. Your FSH is just a diagnostic test. Just kind of guides us and tells us what's going on. I can put patients on a fertility meter. I mean, I don't really do that, but in my head, I'm saying that so that everyone knows what their IVF pyramid looks like. And your FSH isn't something that you can treat. It's just something that changes from month to month. So it's just something to understand. So you have the right set of expectations going into treatment. Next question, if doing IVF with PGT testing, how long does the whole process take from first day of meds up to embryo transfer? Great question. You guys all know about my egg whisper diet. Diagnosis, month one. IVF, month two. Embryo transfer planning, month three. Transfer, month four. What's up? So that's basically how long it takes from start to finish. And I have patients like, I just want to put an embryo in. I'm like, that's fine. But we work really hard for these embryos, so we want to make sure we're doing everything right. However, Patients get pregnant all the time from fresh embryo transfers too. So I do fresh embryo transfers, freeze the rest. If that transfer doesn't work, then we consider our options from there. So your priorities are always mine. Next question is, I have a cyst on my left ovary all last year that stayed the same size and it didn't grow. Went through three IUIs and all failed. Starting my IVF stem soon. Anything that I need to do to be successful? What is that cyst? That's what I want to know. Is it endometriosis? Is it a dermoid? Is it a simple functional cyst? Talk to your doctor and see what is that cyst? What have you ruled out? What is my diagnosis? So I find out what your diagnosis is before you do IVF. Next question. I'm 36 years old. My AMH is 0.7. I have a 20 millimeter complex cyst in my right ovary. My right ovary is functioning normally with it. My doctor would wait to remove it before I wants to, um, uh, would want it removed before IVF, but wants me to try IUI first question is, should I start with surgery? I would start with IVF first, but listen to your doctor. I mean, obviously they've seen your ovaries, but my thing is this, you're 36, your AMH is 0.7. If someone's doing surgery on your ovaries, guess what? Even if God touches you, they're going to potentially remove healthy eggs and we can't afford that. You guys, every egg counts. So my approach would be embryo creation first, surgery next, and then transfer. IUI is still going to be an option down the road, but right now that's what I would do in a case like yours. Next question is from Amber. What do you suggest for best success of implantation? So I would suggest making sure you understand your diagnosis, right? And then, you know, you've done your IVF cycles and then now you're prepared for transfer. Make sure you remember what your diagnosis is, right? So if it was endometriosis and tubal blockage, make sure you've addressed that before you transferred. So those are the kinds of things that I talk to patients about. Here we go. I had the start of a polyp removed and one failed intracervical insemination at home. Is it important to find out if my cervix is tipped? And the answer is no, everyone has a certain tip to their cervix, either tip back, tip forward, kind of in the middle. I don't think it's a big deal at all. It doesn't cause fertility issues. Next question is, thanks for answering my question. You're the coolest. You're welcome. Next person saying I used Mosey and it did not work. I can tell you that Mosey um, isn't just basically, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to show you what I call the Amy baby. If I can find it, I can't find it. Nope. We're not going to see it tonight. Usually I have my version here in my little desk drawer. I got lots of fun things in this desk drawer, but apparently not the one thing that I wanted to find. Uh, last question is fibroid surgery invasive. And it just really depends on where the fibroid is. So if it's inside the wall of the uterus and it's really big, then you might need something called a laparoscopic removal where they just drop a camera down your belly, or they'll do something called a mini laparotomy, which is a tiny little incision right above your pubic bone, like a C-section scar. Alternatively, if it's a small little ball inside the cavity of the uterus, then we can actually just take a camera and shave it out, and that's called a hysteroscopy. So that's another way of doing it. Cervical stenosis is a question that someone is asking, and what is it? Cervical stenosis just means you have your cervix like this, and there's a little pinpoint hole there. A lot of people, their hole's a little bit bigger than others. <laughs> that sounded really funny, you guys. And then you just take a catheter and you pop it in, and if you can't get the catheter in, it's like called cervical stenosis. It just means it's really hard to get a catheter through and you got to dilate a little bit before you put a catheter in. Um, someone is asking, what's Amy, baby? Do you prefer that over Mosey? Well, my name's Amy. And when you're my patient and you want the Amy, baby, <laughs> no, um, I give, I've been giving my patients home insemination kits since I started my practice. And it's just basically a syringe, a cup, and that's it. Nothing fancy. Um, last question is, how do you treat a donor to have the 
least side effects during or after egg retrieval. So, okay, so as far as, you know, how to have the best egg retrieval experience is to hydrate really well, have pain medications on hand, don't tough anything out, you know, make sure you have protein rich drinks and foods at home. And then after the egg retrieval to prevent OHSS, if you have lots and lots of eggs, consider bromocryptine, you know, Femera, for example, is another thing, and then continue the um, protein powders and shakes, and then also use Hespan as uh, a way to, uh, at the time of the egg retrieval, that has been shown to help prevent OHSS as well. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop answering your questions because I got to review trigger instructions. I told everyone to call them at 630, and here we are nine minutes past, and I got people to trigger. So thank you guys for joining me tonight. I hope you guys have a great night, and I'll see you guys very, very soon. I love you all. Thank you for being so resilient and strong, and thank you for inspiring me through the questions that you ask. And I know that you're inspiring others. So go to asktheegwhisper.com if you have a question. You can add it there, and Paula will email you once it's um, once I'm going to answer your questions, so you can tune in and listen. And if you're not tuning in live, no big deal. You can watch it later. Okay, bye guys. Have a great night. See you guys soon.